Today we're going to talk about Beautify 2 Plus, which is a, a, a timeline of since we've released 2.0, how we've improved the framework, and where we're going for version 3. So if you don't know who I am, my name is John Leader. I am the author of Beautify, and I've been working uh, on Beautify since 2016, and it has been my full-time job since 2017. And if you haven't heard of Beautify, the best way that I explain it to people is if a house had blueprints and a foundation, then Beautify is the decor and the paint on the walls. So we provide users of all experiences, from back-end developers to front-end developers, the tools to create rich applications very easily. So with version two, which was released in July of last year, we had a lot of improvements that we were able to make from version one, and anybody who's ever used version one probably knows some of those uh, struggles. And uh, so we kind of went back to the drawing board and figured out, well, what is not good about the framework, which is what I usually ask people, what, what do you not like about it? And one of the biggest complaints was accessibility. So accessibility, WCAG section 508, all supported now. Uh, complete RTL support. Conversion to TypeScript to SAS. So we have um, TypeScript uh, typing support. We've moved from stylus to SAS, a little bit more accessible for more people to contribute. And um, we've also made massive performance increase uh, to inputs. If anyone's ever used those, uh, there were caveats with rendering that we were able to solve that um, for people that use lots of form inputs, we were able to reduce the compilation time. We added bunches of new components and new things like the Observer API, which has allowed us to do some pretty amazing things, lazy loading, um, built into images automatically, but also giving the developer the ability to use that themselves. So let's talk about accessibility. If you're not using standard HTML elements, it's hard. <laughs> and we discovered this early on. And what we had to figure out was a, a component can have multiple different accessibility props depending upon the state in which it's used. A button could be used for multiple different things and have different accessibility attributes. So utilizing scope slots, what we can do is calculate that inside the component and pass the information down to you. So just like right here, we are taking the attributes and the listeners that we put through the scope slots. And what we end up with is a accessible um, component that is dynamic depending upon if you're using a button or not, doesn't matter. You can apply the attributes and actually have proper accessibility support. Now just like with anything else, it's an ongoing process, but along the way we were able to um, run into an open source de developer named Fighter, um, who <laughs> is a dedicated accessibility guy at his job. And they were working on some uh, updates and I said, hey, why don't you come on the team? So we've actually had him with us for about a month and a half now, and uh, we're, we've been working with him to make sure that we uh, continue to uh, improve that aspect. They have the actual NVDA readers over there. And again, we've also been adding uh, documentation regarding what that accessibility is on the components to explain to you, this is what it does, this is why it does it, and here's the documentation to explain that more in depth. We improved our internationalization. So Beautify right now, I think, supports about 30 languages out of the box, and we're always adding new ones. And what this language does is it, it propagates down to our components. We also integrate with Vue i18n. But what this allows you to do is you can change your language at the top level, and all of the Beautify components automatically update with that language. So here is an example. At runtime, we can change the language. And what ends up happening is every single component that utilizes that language is going to automatically update. So it's dynamic, it automatically propagates, and again, we support Vue i18n if you need a more rich solution that you need more options to be available. RTL, another big thing, um, we actually have 100% RTL support now. Um, it was something that we lacked on in version 1.5, no longer the case. And just like everything else, it's dynamic. You can change it on the fly in the entire application automatically updates. So not only does it make it easier for you to globally change RTL, but you also have the ability to at the component level, because there may be situations in which, maybe for display, that you want to change the uh, RTL position of the component. And this is the uh, same with most of our properties. We try to say, hey, here's a default, but if you want to use something different, you can. Again, we talked about, I talked about TypeScript a little bit, um, something that's gonna be a lot easier to do with the composition API in version three, which the team has been very excited to work on. Um, but one of the big things that we wanted to do, especially just for ourselves in development, was figure out how to get proper TypeScript support in the library. 
And while a couple of areas may be rough around the edges, for the most part, we have a really good implementation that not only provides type safety for us, but allows other developers to tap into that same TypeScript. So in uh, version two, we converted to SAS, but we wanted to improve the process of working with it. So what we did uh, using the Vue CLI plugin, we created our own, and we were able to hook in, we have a custom Webpack loader called Vuetify Loader, and dynamically check for variable files based upon you know, what we tell them to put there, and automatically load it into your application, hoisting the variables above so that you can modify the Vuetify styles uh, at runtime when you're developing, um, and then have that persist whenever you compile down. Now you have your own individual style. And what that does is it makes it really easy to any time you can opt in to modify the styles, and we have tons of SAS variables available. The, uh, the only um, con is that it increases compilation time uh, initially by about 10 to 20 seconds, which we are working on, but we think that it's a very small trade-off for how much flexibility comes with being able to customize the framework at that kind of detailed level. And again, I always hear this at the time, my designer still hates material design. <laughs> how do I get him to actually or her to use it? So we've already had the tools to do this in Beautify, but we didn't have a really good process for explaining it. And in version two, uh, Google released what's called material studies. And what material studies are is they use the uh, baseline of material design and they add some different styling to it to show people how you can customize an app with material design but have it look completely different. So what we did is we took Vue CLI again, very powerful tool, and we created these presets, threw in a little bit of magic, and you can automatically download and install locally or share it, a completely separate theme experience for Vuetify with just one file. Um, so it allows you to kind of have a cohesive process where you feel like you can modify the look of your application um, in, a, in a way that is recommended by us as opposed to us not providing you the information. We give you tons of variables to be able to modify. And again, this is the foundation for future features in which we're gonna to try to make more customization options available with the framework JavaScript-wise at a top level. Another thing we did, some quality of life changes. Uh, we are uh, working with the Intersection Observer API, which does have polyfills for Inter -Explorer, uh, Internet Explorer 11. And when I saw this, I'd never seen it before, and I was like, wow, this is really powerful. We could use this to do some things like lazy loading. And what we did is we essentially created a directive and then created a component with it and then was able to propagate it down to something like the image, for example. So when you use Beautify and you have an image component, it automatically is going to lazily load. You don't have to worry about that. It just does it right out of the box. And you can also opt into progressive images. So if, for example, you've ever been on medium and you see the image blur and then come into focus, that's automatically out of the box supported in Beautify with our loader. Opens up the door to lots of new components. Um, we've had uh, vLazy is another example where you can have a component that will not render its content until the user has it on their screen. And then we also converted what we call detachables. So these are components that have content that detaches to the root of the DOM to be able to be positioned somewhere. This is a dialog menu and tooltip. We used to do that eagerly. Now everything is lazy loaded, which you can opt in for eager, but what that did is it reduced the need for components to mount and then detach content, which drastically increased the performance. And the ultimate goal is we want better SEO, we want smaller bundle sizes, and we really want improved performance. Um, we did this with version 1.5, but for version 2, we're upping it a little higher. Um, when version 3 of Beautify releases, uh, we're going to iterate the current major, one more minor, and then we're going to start 18 months support on it. We currently have uh, long-term support on version 1.5, so if you're already using that and you didn't know that, you have it until July. But when version 3 comes out, we're going to offer the same, um, the same support for version 2. And the reason why we want to do this is, one, because no one else is really doing it. But it, it gives uh, developers some confidence knowing that, hey, this is gonna be supported for longer than you know, whenever the guy decides to come back online. It, all, it gives uh, people a lot more confidence to work with it, and then we work with businesses to be able to create easy upgrade guides so um, whenever we introduce a new version, it's smooth as possible for the developer. And again, peace of mind so that you know that the software that you're using is going to be supported in the long term. 
Now, a few years ago, when Vue got established in version two, the team set out to create tooling for it, which is a very important aspect to be anything successful with the framework. With the release of version two, and as we've iterated to version 2.2, I really feel uh, that the system is mature enough to be able to go in and start creating tools that make it easier to not only develop with Beautify, but anything that you want to. So this ecosystem uh, is mostly intact with a few that are still in alpha, but the idea is to provide the user with the tools to be able to have an efficient and clean development process. For example, our ESLint plugin will automatically upgrade your application from 1.5 to 2.0 for the grid system. Don't even have to do anything. Uh, ESLint config, we work with the, uh, the Vue ESLint config plugin, make it a little better, <laughs> and then package that within um, some of our um, bundles that we give out for projects. Uh, the Beautify Loader, as I discussed before, this is uh, something kind of unique. We have automatic tree shaking for styles and components that is built in out of the box. So whenever you install Beautify with Vue CLI, as soon as you compress and compile your um, application, it is gonna get rid of everything that you're not using without having to configure anything for yourself. And uh, we have some additional things that I'm gonna talk about, like our CLI plugin, a storybook, and uh, our Beautify CLI. So again, this is what I talked about with the progressive images. Uh, with just two lines defining a, an image and a width, whenever we compile down, we have an automatically um, progressive image. The loader in the middle is optional, but it increases the loading of the web page for the users, makes Google happy for SEO, and it's really cool to just work out of the box. And I talked about the tree shaking. Uh, most of our users only end up using between 20 and 40% of the components. And as a uh, component library, no matter how good we are, we're gonna grow horizontally. And in order to solve that, we needed to be able to tree shake. So once we've introduced this, and, and again, this is built in by default, um, we noticed that the bundle sizes got so low that it made it easier for us to do different things within the framework because we weren't as concerned with bloating things because we knew that it would be tree shaken if it wasn't used. So this is the start of the ecosystem that uh, we have been working on for Beautify. And the idea is, beyond the default install, I wanted users to be able to type one line and be able to have an application that is scaffolded with the Vue CLI, but with some Beautify additions so that developers can be confident that what they're doing is a recommended path. So this is done through presets. If you've ever created a Vue application, at the end of the process, it's probably asked you, do you want to save it as a preset? Well, we can actually make these as remote GitHub repos, and we can tell DeVue to create a project using that preset. So what that allows us to do is bundle up some of these uh, features and tooling dynamically uh, into a project where you can type one line and you can start developing in just a minute. But then it expands. So going to the next level, maybe you don't need a CLI or a lot of extra uh, unit testing and you want the base, but maybe you need more. So with the Essential plugin, we're gonna be bringing in the Beautify CLI. And if you've ever worked with Laravel or Django, I really enjoy the scaffolding portion of it. And I was trying to come up with ways to solve the unit test issue, where no one can ever write a unit test because no one finds value in them. And the only way that I could think of was to automate it. And because Vue CLI lets us tap into the internal system to determine what plugins are installed, we can actually say, hey, do they have unit tests installed? Well, if they do, we'll use the default scaffold and generated unit test for them. Don't like that way we do it? Create your own. But the idea is to have an entire system that works together. You create a new component and you have unit tests in Storybook, we automatically generate that for you. So even if you're unable to get to the unit test at the time or the Storybook, it's automatically done for you so you don't have to think about it. Improves your productivity, reduces the things that you have to think about, and ultimately it just makes it easier and better applications for developers. So now version three. Titan. So this is something that the team is extremely excited about, mainly because the Composition API opens up a lot of possibilities uh, for framework libraries like us. And considering we already use render functions like crazy, it pretty much translates very easily. So whenever we decided we're gonna work on version three, what were the goals that we wanted? Well, we wanted to use the Composition API because it provided better TypeScript support and overall it was a much, you know, it's a newer system, it's faster. We wanted to replace mixins with effects. Uh, Beautify is probably the sole reason why Evan destroyed mixins because we have a thousand of them. 
We wanted to improve the component structure. Um, for me, I like to have things written down and not have to think about it again. So in this case, and it's at the bottom of the screen, there'll be a bigger um, picture later, but if you go to notion.beautifiedjs.com, you can actually see our entire upgrade plan down to the coding guidelines that we're using to develop version three. So it's a really good way for us to not only define how the framework's built, but also put it out there to say, hey, this is how we do things. Do you have improvements? Do you want to help? And it's complete transparency, and it helps us build a better framework with having so many eyes helping with that process. And then, again, we want to improve the development process, not just for us, but for contributors and people that use Beautify in general. So reducing complexity. So in version three, this is an example of what our vApp component would look like. And if you've watched Evan's talk from earlier, same thing, we're importing what we use, we're doing generally the same thing we did before as opposed to having a computed property for classes on the view object, we just use the new computed import. And ultimately, when we establish the solid coding guidelines, we identify the primary role of what a component or feature should do to find its scope of responsibility, we take out all of the out-of-scope functionality and abstract that into something that's shared, improve the contributor experience, and just make it easier overall to maintain. One of the biggest issues with Beautify is that it is popular, so it's hard to keep up with everything. So we have to come up with new ways to be more efficient about the process that we're taking. And again, mix and madness, right? It was really good in the beginning. It allowed us to reduce code. It, it made testing very easy. And because we have an extension model for TypeScript support, it just worked great. But the problem is it obfuscates, oh, I can't even say that word, <laughs> where functionality comes from. Uh, it has a high chance of name collisions, and it's really confusing for contributors. And most people that aren't framework libraries really don't even use mix-in. So it was a very difficult uh, feature that we somehow made work, but it obviously wasn't as good as it could be. Makes hard code to reason about, so we decided to introduce effects. And what effects are is it's the composition API, and we go through and reestablish a good readability and process from the coding guidelines that we've designated. You can now see where information comes from. And overall, again, the second composition API, we made a couple tweaks for optimization, but it's essentially the same thing. As opposed to having a computed class, we just have a function that returns that same information. We also use the reactive prop, so that means that we can tell when a, reactive, when a property is reactive because it has the dot value attribute. So these, again, are part of our uh, coding guidelines that we've decided, hey, this makes it easier to read, this makes it easier to work with, so we've established it, written it down, and now we don't have to think about it anymore. So the release, we are working in tandem with Vue. Uh, whenever they release an alpha, we're already on it. And uh, we have been working really closely to make sure that we have a good path forward to do so. Again, this is why we opened up the notion.beautifiedjs.com, which is a complete explanation of everything that we're doing, and also gives users the ability to say, hey, I'd like to contribute, but how can I do that? Well, here's a task, here's the guidelines, here's the component or feature, I should be able to take care of it. And it takes out a lot of the back and forth that requires uh, often with contributors to be able to let them know how to work on something because not everyone is in the framework as much as the core team. <laughs> and lastly, what I want to talk about, and if you've met me, you know how big I am about um, thanking the people that have helped you get where you are. And even though I am the original author of Beautify, <laughs> there is no way, shape, or form it would be where it's at right now without at least some of these people plus many, many more. So to the team, contributors, community, and my family, thank you very much for your support. And at this point, I usually ask everyone if we could please give a round of applause for all the open source maintainers that make our jobs and lives easier. And again, like any project, we do have project sponsors. And they help us maintain uh, the ability to continue with the project and also filter funds down into the, uh, the libraries and the maintainers that don't have a platform that we have. Last year, Beautify was able to give back $12,000 to the open source contributors, including members from the Vue core team, including the Beautify team. So we're able to do this by um, having sponsors that believe in open source, that get value out of the product, and then we can take that and get it down to the people that aren't in a platform to be able to uh, succeed all the time with open source. 
And that's it for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for my, um, my soon-to-be wife, as you can see there. She's manning the booth right now. Um, we work on this both together full-time, and this is a huge passion for us. We do have a booth in the back corner. We would love to talk to you and hear about your thoughts of Vue or Vuetify or any framework. It doesn't really matter. And uh, maybe I'll trap you in a conversation for a little bit. So my name is John Leader, and that's uh, Vuetify 2+. Woo! <laughs>